Hi, today's topic is going to be a fun one because it's all about the Crusades. The Crusades is one of the most misunderstood topics in history. And in order to clear away the misconceptions, we're going to look at the motives behind why the Christians in Europe took up arms to wage war against the Muslims in the Middle East. It was first a reaction to the Muslim Crusades, wars fought between Muslims and non-Muslims. The Muslim Crusades began in the year 630 with Muhammad and his army sacking Mecca. It continued with the conquest of the Middle East by 661, North Africa by 750, the invasion of Europe and conquest of Spain during the 700s, the invasion of France in 732, and the attacks on Italy, Eastern Europe, and the Byzantine Empire during the centuries that followed. Then in 1070, the Muslim Seljuk Turks captured Jerusalem from the Muslim Fatimids. And this was significant because the Seljuk Turks were less tolerant to Christians living in the city, and most had to flee to Europe, complaining of religious persecution and oppression. And by 1095, the Christian Byzantine capital of Constantinople was under threat from the Seljuk Turk army. So much so that the Byzantine Emperor Alexius I pled to Pope Urban II in Rome that he needed assistance to defend his empire. It was then that Pope Urban II launched the First Crusade. From the perspective of the Muslim world, it was Allah's will to spread the faith. In many of these regions, prior to the arrival of the Muslims, the lands were unstable due to infighting between rival groups among the natives. Many natives welcomed the Muslim armies in hopes of peace and stability being brought to the region. As for their siege on Constantinople, it had always been a high-valued prize for Islam. Muhammad himself had predicted, you shall conquer Constantinople. What a wonderful leader he will be, and what a wonderful army will that be. The first army that goes on expedition to Constantinople will be forgiven. The first crusade had a two-pronged mission for the Christians. First, they must retake the Holy Land, Jerusalem, from the Muslims so that Christians could once again feel free to live and travel there. And two, to save Constantinople. By doing so, Pope Urban II hoped that the Byzantine Christians would rejoin the Catholic faith in gratitude. After the schism of 1054, the Christian faith had fractured into Catholicism in the West and Orthodox in the East. The Pope wanted to bridge that schism. The First Crusade was a success for the Christians. They had liberated Constantinople, took Jerusalem, and established four crusader kingdoms in the Middle East. The Crusades, as with all wars, were a brutal and dangerous affair. So you might ask, why would someone leave their home and family to risk their life in a faraway land and kill a faraway people? There were many reasons for joining a crusade. For instance, the church promised them immediate salvation in heaven. Whatever sins you are guilty of, no problem. God will forgive you. Many were motivated by the church, who sanctioned that all who joined a crusade would be free of one's feudal lord. Not only would they get out of paying rent while they were away, but it was required that the lord had to give money to the peasants that worked their land or their knights to pay for the trip to the Holy Land. And, like most young men that joined the military today, they sought adventure. While the First Crusade seemed to go in the Christians' favor, the Second Crusade went in the Muslims' favor. A Syrian leader named Saladin managed to unite the squabbling Muslims, even between the Sunni and Shia, and retake Jerusalem. Then under these terms I surrender Jerusalem. Assalamu alaikum. And peace be with you. What is Jerusalem worth? Nothing.
This led to the King of England leading the Third Crusade. His name was Richard the Lionheart. Saladin and Richard were the greatest military geniuses of their generation. Evenly matched, both trying to outsmart the other. Richard's Christian army won a great victory against Saladin's forces at the Battle of Arsuf in 1191, giving the Christians control of the ports along the Palestinian coast. But Richard failed two attempts to take Jerusalem from Saladin's hands. By 1192, both armies were exhausted and desired peace. And at a time in history when diplomacy was scarce, Richard and Saladin signed a peace treaty, ending the Third Crusade. The Muslims would retain control of Jerusalem, but Christian pilgrims would be allowed access to the city. But this wasn't an end to the Crusades. The Fourth Crusade was a complete backfire of the Christians. The Byzantine Emperor Alexios had promised to pay the Christians to retake Jerusalem, but on the way he was murdered in an uprising. With no one to pay them, the Crusader army attacked Constantinople itself. The city and the empire would never be the same. Throughout the 13th century, there were other Crusades that tried to take Jerusalem and defend the four Crusader kingdoms. There was one so-called Children's Crusade that took place when thousands of children marched to Jerusalem. However, they never reached it. Many historians believe that they had been captured by Muslim slave traders. The Ninth and Last Crusade ended after Prince Edward of England had defended the last Crusader kingdom of Antioch. He had received word that his father, the king, had died, and so he raced back home to England to defend his throne. But when he was away, Antioch fell, and the Crusades ended. In England, Edward would become known as Edward the Longshanks due to his gangly legs, most known for his war against the Scots in the movie Braveheart. Trouble with Scotland is that it's full of Scots. Though the Christians failed to ultimately capture Jerusalem and gained no territory in the Middle East, the Crusades weren't entirely a failure. Europe had benefited in unforeseen ways. During much of the Middle Ages, trade was at a standstill, but as Crusader armies passed through towns, businesses sprung up, supplying the soldiers with needed goods. Countless feudal lords were killed or went bankrupt paying for their peasants and knights' journeys to the Holy Land. So what happened to their land? It went to the kings and strengthened the king's power, slowly putting an end to the feudal system. But the most important impact on Europe was what the knights brought back. I'm home at last. Where are my prisoners? Oh. Can you not see what a hard time he's had? Look at him, he's covered in Saracen blood. Well, it's not gold, is it? What are you complaining for? I bought loads of good stuff back from the Crusades. Spices, perfume, sugar, silk, lemons, oranges, apricot, melons, rhubarb, nah. dates, coffee, rice, mirrors, carpets, cotton, paper, wheelbarrows, mattresses, shawls, and chess sets. Checkmate. <laughs> You've got another crusade to go on. They brought back knowledge, such as Greek and Roman classic literature, art and technology, all of which would pull Europe out of the Dark Ages and introduce a whole new era of learning and progress known as the Renaissance. Well, that about wraps it up for the Crusades. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a few things. And next time, next time we're going to cover late medieval Europe. I'll see you then.